Thanks. Thank you, John. Uh, we're super excited to be here presenting in Bay Sites. So we are about botnets all the time. And in this session, we'll give you a deep dive into one of them, the Cashman Black botnet. Uh, I will start by talking about botnets in general and describe the Cashman Black and its entities. Then Ophir will present the operation and talk about the DevOps behind it. Oh, sorry. Uh, but first, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Sarit, and I'm a security researcher at Imperva for the last 10 years. I mainly focus on web application security, and I develop algorithms to detect and protect against attacks. My colleague Ophir is a security researcher at Imperva for the last five years. His focus is in database and web application security. Before we start to deep dive into Kashmir Black, I would like to talk about botnets in general. So there are many kinds of botnets. Botnets that infect IoT devices, Windows machines, Linux servers. Some target the endpoint and others target the servers. Now, when talking about botnet purposes, there are cryptojacking botnets that infect machines in order to mine for cryptocurrencies. Other botnets manage phishing campaigns and are used to distribute malware via phishing emails. There are botnets that are used to perform DDoS attacks by sending an overwhelming number of requests to a targeted server or an application. In addition, there are scraping botnets that are being used to extract data from websites and even account takeover botnets that are being used to validate combinations of credentials resulting in identity thefts. And other botnets are offered for rent and may use for any purpose. Before I dive into the bits and bytes of our research, I would like to introduce you with the Cashman Black botnet. So it all started on November 2019 and last 11 months, which is basically our research period of time. We discovered a botnet that attacks popular CMS platforms, such as WordPress, Joomla, Magento, in more than 60 different countries around the world. It performs millions of attacks per day on average, and we calculated that there were hundreds of thousands of bots out there participated in the botnet operation. Those bots utilize dozens of known vulnerabilities with different attack types, like file upload, remote code execution, and many more. This session is a journey into the botnet core from the attacker point of view. So let's start. Security research investigation can sometimes be like a crime scene investigation, but our crime scene is spread all over the network with nobody in place. So we need to collect the clues and fingerprints to construct a picture of the virtual crime. As part of a study carried out at Imperva, we observed around 9 million attack attempts exploiting PHP unit remote code execution. And we were wondering, why is this CV so popular among attackers? And to understand this hype, we started to analyze attacks from our data lake. We saw different IPs using the same payload over and over again, attacking different customers, which remind us of botnet behavior. So we decided to download the payload and dive in. And we basically started the mapping step. We downloaded the code and performed analysis. We revealed all the entities of the operation, and later on, we'll talk about them in further detail. The next step we took was infiltrate. We saw that the bot is updating on a regular basis, and we decided to act like a bot and gather these updates for later analysis. And finally, we played a victim. We created a honeypot in order to understand this post-exploitation stage. So let's review all those entities that play a role in this massive operation. When looking at the botnet entities, we can split them into three groups. The botnet infrastructure, the botnet third-party services, and the botnet actors. Inside the botnet infrastructure, we have the CNC and repositories A and B. Under the third-party services, we have GitHub, Facebean, and Dropbox that our attacker was using in one hand to camouflage the operation, and on the other hand, to make the botnet more flexible. And under the botnet actors, we have the victim and two types of bots, pending and spreading. And I will describe the difference between these later on. 
The first entity in the bonnet infrastructure, which is responsible for the entire operation, is the command control. And here we can see the login screen of the CNC. The Kashmir Black CNC is located in Indonesia and has three main roles. It supplies attack instructions to bot. It receives attack reports from bots. And it supplies a malicious script that infects the victim server. Here is a snapshot of the infection script. We can see that the attacker defines a parameter that represents a current up task. This task contains a Python script and scheduled to run every three minutes. It includes several imports and it uses base64 encoding to obfuscate his malicious payload. The output of this task will be sent to DevNow, so no history will be saved. In the next code block, we can see that the attacker redefines the victim cron task to include this malicious Python task. And as part of this redefinition, the attacker makes sure to remove all main notifications. And there is one interesting thing to note here is that the attacker was using the combination of, of Perl and Python, which are both are installed out of the box in many Linux systems. And basically this increases the probability of a successful infection. Let's move to the repositories. The original repository A, as you can see, is a printer component shopping site. It was hacked by the attacker and was used to store the communication script file to communicate with the CNC. Another type of repository entity in the botnet is repository B, which is, um, it was classified as an educational institute and was used by the attacker to store bundles of exploit and payloads. And here is an example of the exploit payload bundles. The attacker files are located under the CSS path. Among other CSS files used by this innocent web server, the name of the bundle files start with the in-memory prefix. And there are actually zip files hidden with the CSS extension. And here is their modification date. And one of the best qualities of this botnet is that the infrastructure is just like plug and play. The attacker can expand his target victims and add new exploits by just uploading them here under the CSS directory. And no infrastructure changes are required. And I must add that every file here represents an exploit that targets a specific vulnerability. Here is a partial list of CVEs the botnet uses as part of its operation. Among them, we can see remote code execution, file upload, remote file include, and, and many more. These vulnerabilities are related to different plugins, widgets, and themes, and some are even a decade old from 2011. And the conclusion here is that it's not necessary to use an exotic exploit in order to expand a button. Moving to the cloud-based services. Another type of entity used by the attacker is GitHub. It was used as a version control to store some of these files. And when we check the repositories, we saw PHP web shells and crypto miners. And we can say that by using GitHub, the bot achieves a layer of flexibility. As the attacker can easily update a file in this repository without interfering with the botnet activity. Another entity is Spacebeam which is a website that allows anonymous users to share plain text through public posts. They, they are called paste. And the attacker used this paste as a quick and easy way to access and download vectors through the infection step in the botnet operation. And later we'll show how Dropbox was used in order to upgrade the botnet, hide the operation behind legit cloud services, and also to secure the CNC. Now, let's talk about the two types of bots. First, the spreading bot. This bot constantly communicates with the CNC to receive attack in instructions. Those are commands from the CNC telling him who to attack and how. This bot is being used to infect new machines and to expand the botnet. And a victim that was infected by a spreading bot can become one of two, a spreading bot or a pending bot. Now, let's talk about the pending bot. And as I said before, this bot is a victim site that was infected by a spreading bot, the one that appears here. And as a result, 
is under the control of the CNC. And it stays in idle mode until the CNC approach and change its purpose. And actually, this is why we named it pending bot. And I will talk about the purpose in a bit. But I want to add that the difference between them is that the pending bot does not initiate communication with the CNC. Let's move to the Cashman Black botnet scope, the infiltrate step. The best way to learn of organization is to be part of it. Same for learning about a botnet operation. And we call it the infiltrate step. So once we mapped all the entities of the botnet, we wanted to understand the scope of the botnet, its victims, the attack, and its evolution. And to answer those questions, we had to take a more active approach to the investigation. We learned the communication protocol between the bot and the CNC, and we mimicked it. We infiltrated the botnet by constant communication with the CNC. We went undercover and impersonated the spreading bot in the botnet. And without actually attacking any targets, we started to collect information about the botnet victims. And here is an example of a request from a spreading bot to the CNC asking to get the attack instructions. And we can see that there is a special header that without it, the CNC will not return anything. The special user agent, Archer Ghost 8, is some kind of a security mechanism to prevent unauthorized access. And although this is not a sophisticated authentication mechanism, it is a basic security control for the CNC. Now, as a result to, to the request we just saw, the pending bot will get attack instructions from the, in JSON format from the CNC. And the first parameter, the script, contains the commands that will be executed by the spreading bot. First, it will run the curl command to download the exploit payload bundle that will be used to infect the victim. And here we can see the file to download. And it, it, we can see that it's located under the CSS directory in repository B, the, the one that just, I, I just showed you. And the second parameter, the payload, contained, contains a list of victim sites that will be attacked by the spreading bot. The last parameter is the host name or IP that hosts all those victim sites. Now, as I said before, we impersonated a spreading bot in the botnet by sending a request every three minutes to fetch attack instructions from the CNC. We gathered all these in inst instructions for further analysis, and we used Shodan API to extract the organization, the country, the ASN, the vulnerabilities, and open ports, and the installed components of each target. Then we inserted everything into a database for a detailed analysis. So let's see what we learned. One of the things we wanted to learn was about the location of the targets to see if there is a specific country that, it, that this botnet targets. And here is the distribution of the attack targets divided by country. And it's a bit hard to see, but we found 60 different countries this botnet targets. It appears that the majority of the targets are located in the US. This is the blue part. But since a lot of servers are actually hosted by cloud providers, the original country of the server does not necessarily reflect on the origin of the victim. Another interesting question we're curious about is, how the attacker find these targets? So we believe that the attacker had some sort of a scanner that scans for potential vulnerable targets. And this scanner probably uses Shodan or a similar service like Binary Edge to locate for potential targets by searching for specific vulnerability or open ports. Another method this attacker may use is running CMS vulnerability scanners like CMS map or WP scan that helps with finding potential vulnerable targets. So once a target is identified, it is being initiated inside a queue in the CNC for a future attack. And basically, when a pending bot will fetch attack instruction from the CNC, the target will, will be taken from this queue. Moving to the botnet purposes. So in order to understand the purpose of those victims pending bots, we had to become a victim ourselves. So we created a CMS honeypot 
and attacked it with our spreading bot from the infiltration step. We reported back to the CNC of a successful attack. And by that, our honeypot became a pending bot in the Cashman Black botnet, waiting for the CNC to approach. So after we reported to the CNC of a successful attack, it took the attacker one and a half hours to connect our honeypot, which is kind of impressive uh, as, it, as it's very quickly. And we had a sort of uh, log inside the honeypot showing us which command the attacker did and which files he added or modified. And we saw that he added a second web shell, a second web shell with command execution for capability. Then he ran several commands to escalate his privileges by using Simlink. And by that, our attacker got complete control on the infected server. Now, let's continue to the purposes of the botnet. We saw five purposes. About the first two, we already discussed. There was a depending bot and the spreading bot. So we'll talk about the others. An exciting purpose we observed is a crypto miner that mines Monero coins. And as part of the colonizers we did, we got access to the hacker's payment address. And we can see his balance in real time. The next purpose was discovered as a result of our CMS honeypot. It was converted into a clickbait bot. When we tried to access the Honeypot's login page, we were redirected to one of many clickbait sites. The last purpose is defacement. Once we saw the defacement signature, we discovered the nickname of the hacker behind the botnet. We also discovered that he is part of the Indonesian hacker crew Phantom Ghost. By searching the internet, we found out more interesting information about the crew, like the Facebook page, and even an online shop that sells the Phantom Ghost crew t-shirts. Now, after we're familiar with all the entities, we will continue and show the entire operation in live. Thank you, Sarit, and hi, everyone. So how this botnet works? It all starts when a bot exploits PHP unit remote code execution on a victim server. It causes the victim server to download an infection script from the CNC. Then it will execute it. Now, the infected server will approach repository A every three minutes to download the fresh communication script. At this stage, we can say that the victim server is part of the Cashmere Black botnet. A newly infected bot communicates with the CNC to get attack instructions describing who to attack and which bundle to use. The bot downloads the bundle from repository B and additional payloads from GitHub and Paste. Then the bots attack the victim and on successful attack, it will become part of the botnet. As a last step in the process, the bot reports back to the CNC. Now, that we are familiar with the operation, we can move on and describe the stages of the botnet since we discovered it and throughout the research period. When we first met Kashmir Black, it had around 10 exploits and only two payloads, pending and spreading. It focused only on growth, increasing the size of the botnet. Then infrastructure changes started to emerge to make the botnet more stable and scalable. Compared to the first two stages, the expansion stage is an ongoing process. We saw more exploits and more payloads are being added during the entire research period. Now let's dive into each one of the stages, starting with the growth. Kashmir Black has an exponential growth. I'm going to show you how we came to this conclusion. So we observed 285 bots in our data lake attacking our customers. But note that this is only a portion of the bots in the botnets, since we see only traffic of our customers. So for this example, I'm going to round the numbers a little bit for simplicity, and I will use 300 bots. So. We know that every bot performing attack 
every three minutes. Per day, it will attack 480 targets. The 300 bots together are performing 140,000 of attacks per day. Now, let's say that only half percent of all the targets are successfully infected. It means that tomorrow we'll have 1,000 new bots, in addition to our current 300 bots. By day number seven, we will have almost half million bots. The following chart illustrates the exponential growth. Now let's move on from the growth to the stability stage. In this stage, we will describe the evolution of the botnet over the research period and the DevOps strategy that enable it to carry out its crimes. Remember that the, the botnet had only one repository, A and B. Once the botnet size increased, so did the load on the repositories. In addition, since those repositories were actually legitimate sites, they couldn't be considered as permanent and reliable entities. The attacker had to take action. Three changes were implemented in the botnet infrastructure. Uh, the first is adding new entity, repository A load balancer expand repository A into multiple repositories and expand repository B. There were three main reasons behind these changes. Make the botnet more dynamic and scalable, add redundancy and load balancing. The following diagram shows the old infrastructure against the new one. While in the old infrastructure, Every bot will address directly repository A. In the new one, each bot will address the load balancer and will get in return one of many repositories. To integrate this change into the botnet operation, an additional change in the botnet was required. We will discuss this change later on when we will expl explore the upgrade process. Now, let's talk about internal changes that were made in order to secure the CNC and the botnet operation. The CNC is the most sensitive and important component in the entire operation. Securing it is critical. Let me take you back a little bit to the steps where we infiltrated the botnet and played the victim. We created a honeypot, attacked it with our spreading bot, and reported back to the CNC. We believe that the attacker grew suspicious as he performed two internal changes in order to avoid interfering with the botnet. Reporting address was changed and bot IP tracking mechanism was added. The first change is related to the reporting address. This change helps with managing bots and versions. Bot that report to the new address is a new bot. Second change is within the botnet's communication script. It was updated with a bot tracking mechanism. A simple architectural change adds the bot IP and country while it communicated with the CNC. It allowed the CNC to track and monitor uh, the operation of each bot in the botnet. There are two goals behind this mechanism. The first is to secure the botnet, and the second is to manage bots' versions and upgrades. Now, let's see how it comes to work. The changes that we described created a situation where some bots were using the new infrastructure, while others uh, were only aware of the old one. This diagram describes the upgrade process. On the left side, you can see the old infrastructure. When an old bot communicates with the CNC without the IP tracking header, the CNC in return sends back attack instructions that instruct the bot to download the upgrade script from repository B. 
Once the bot executes the upgrade script, it will turn into a new bot that is now aware of the new infrastructure. On the, on the right side, the upgraded bot will address the load balancer to get, to get one of many uh, repositories. The upgrade script is actually changing the cron-tab job that Sarit mentioned earlier. Now, let's talk about migrating the CNC to a cloud-based service. There are fundamental problems in the botnet architecture. Since bots communicating directly with the CNC and the repositories, their IP is exposed and security controls may block them. An interesting infrastructure change has evolved to solve this problem, integrating Dropbox into the operation. Instead of communicating directly with the infrastructure entities, the CNC and the repositories, the bots are now communicating only with Dropbox. Now, Dropbox API is being used to fetch attack instructions and to upload reports from bots. This is a big step towards camouflaging the botnet traffic, securing the CNC operation, and most importantly, making it hard, make it difficult to trace back to the hacker behind the operation. When we discovered this change, we were very excited since we had the authorization key of the Dropbox account of the attacker. We thought, we thought to ourselves, it will be fun to connect and see what's going on. We started to fetch all the files from the account and we saw uh, the structure of the account. Sorry. So the root directory is Adelia P. We believe that the name Adelia is significant for the attacker because we saw it in several places during our analysis. It used in passwords and inside URLs inside the CNC. Next, we have the payload directory uh, that was used to store attack instructions. We found 400,000 of attack instructions in place. Next, we have the loot directory and it only have one subdirectory called NoSQL. NoSQL is one of the bundles that added by the attacker to repository B meant to attack NoSQL databases with several types of NoSQL injection. Inside, we found only one report. Putting it all together, the loot directory supposed to store the successful attack reports uploaded by bots, split it into subdirectories for each exploit bundle. The assumption is that the attacker was in the middle of transition maybe in the testing phase. This is another piece in the puzzle that helps us to see into the attacker's world and understand the operation, a glimpse into a development cycle in a making. By that, we close the, the stage of stability and now we will focus on the expansion stage. As I said before, the expansion stage is an ongoing process. The attacker adds new exploits on a regular basis. Over the research period, the exploits were extended from 10 to 17, targeting new domains, expanding the botnet targets from CMS that are based on Apache to new domains such as web servers that are running over IIS, and even exploring NoSQL databases. As part of our analysis, we fetched the exploits from the repositories and we tried to map them to the affected platform. We saw a total of 17 bundles, while most of the vulnerabilities are in generic plugins and or component, which are compatible with multiple CMS platforms, sorry, <laughs> or PHP web, shell, web, web frameworks. Only one exploit was related to IIS. We mapped 13 different CMS platforms and three PHP web frameworks that may be infected by the Kashmir Black Botnet. 
the percentage shows the distribution of the vulnerabilities for each platform. By that, we close the stages overview. And now let's discuss some key takeaways. Botnet deployment is similar to application development process. There are some important key features we need to consider in order to create a stable botnet that is here to stay. Those are stability, flexibility, and CICD. So in order to create a stable botnet, we need to take into consideration load balancing and redundancy, enabling scalability while growing. In other words, stability is the foundation that enables the botnet to exist. But this is not enough. The separation of uh, the exploits from the infrastructure enables maximum flexibility as the attacker can add new exploits anytime. Together, those two key features are the basis of the ability to grow and expand. On the other hand, we have the CICD branch that includes version control and deployment cycles. We call it automation. Behind every massive operation, we must have an automatic process to support it. Expansion and growth cannot exist without a solid CICD process. Now, let's talk about the insider point of view. As a security company, we have data of hundreds of thousands of customers where we could see attacks in the wild. But this is not good enough since our data is biased by our customers. Here are a couple of advantages we got from the insider point of view. Being inside the botnet operation gave us the advantage in analysis as we could see the big picture and not just a small portion of the infection. We watched the botnet evolution from the first row. We saw new repositories, exploits and payloads are added in real time. And by analyzing the code changes, we concluded what motivated the attacker to perform such changes. We had a unique foothold that enabled us to analyze the victims from the attack instructions, extracting the country, the platforms, domains, etc. The inside intelligence led us to the educated assumption that there is kind of an automated mechanism that searches for potential vulnerable targets and initiate them inside the queue in the CNC. Analyzing the exploit distribution explains which, which exploits are in use, the distribution of usage, what is the frequency that they are being used, and which are more common than others. All of this information is accessible only from the insider point of view. And it is critical in order to understand the scope of the operation, the motivation, and the challenges of the attacker. Now, let's sum up everything that we talked about. In a botnet development, the attacker wearing multiple hats. The attacker is the developer, the architect, and the DevOps. Usage of third-party services are a critical part of the infrastructure in terms of camouflaging the botnet and bypass security controls. And it is not necessary to use exotic exploits in order to expand. In terms of research, first, we need to map all the entities. We need to learn the communication protocol. And last, visibility is essential to understand the big picture. So what can we do to prevent infection? First, make sure to deploy WAF in front of your application server. Invest in endpoint security, install antivirus software, both on your endpoints and servers. In reference to Kashmir Black, the attacker uploaded web shells that could be blocked by WAF or antivirus. 
Make sure that your server is behind a firewall and allow only authorized services to connect. For example, open SSH only for specific hosts to reduce attack surface. If you are using cloud provider, make sure that your service or host is not publicly open. Make sure that you are up to date with the latest security patches and that there are no unused or unsupported plugins and features installed that might increase your attack surface. And anyway, make sure that you use strong authentication mechanism. You are probably wondering what is the current state of the Kashmir Black Botnet. So when we decided that our research has come to an end, we collected IPs, host names, hosting services, and every possible piece of information from bots, repositories, CNCN entities. We notified the owners of the infected servers and hosting services about the malicious activity. And today, the Kashmir Black Botnet is dead. At least as we know it, we checked our data lake and we couldn't find any traces of new infections. So thank you very much for listening to our talk about Kashmir Black Botnet. Feel free to contact us if you have any questions. And for additional information, you can read the two blogs that we wrote. Uh, just search for Kashmir Black Botnet in Imperva's site. Thank you. So, is there any questions? Uh, let me see. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Shaiti and uh, Ms. Yerul Shami, uh, for your presentation. Uh, this is Nikhil, one of the volunteers. Uh, so now we do have actually a question uh, for you guys uh, in the Q&A session here. Um, why do you think the United States was a larger target compared to the other countries? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, as we said in the uh, we said in the slide that uh, actually we believe that most of the servers are um, uh, were hosted by cloud providers, and let's say that. Uh, uh, when you when you create a, a server in um, over AWS or uh, GCP or whatever, uh, most of you just go to the default, which is um, uh, East, US East, yeah, I think. US East or something like that. So we think this is the reason why most of them look like uh, targeted, like uh, on the US, but it's not reflect on on the real uh, location of the victim of the of the region of it. It just look like the U.S. is uh, most targeted, but it's not. It's not the the real. Um, like like for us, we are located in Israel. Uh, probably, if I will host a, a server on AWS, it will be located on on U.S. So awesome. Uh, so the uh, uh, sorry about that. Uh, what happens to so the next question is what happens to bots that fail to communicate with new infrastructure do they typically retry later or just stay broken so basically the two infrastructures are living together uh, side by side until all the bots are migrating to the new infrastructure it doesn't mean that um the the, the old infrastructure is having some issues with the stability and scalability because there are a lot of bots. But once most of the bots are migrating to the new infrastructure, um, even if some of them didn't uh, su successfully uh, upgraded, uh, they, they keep work. They keep communicate with the CNC and fetch attack instructions and attack victims. Awesome. Yeah. And that's definitely great information. And thank you so much uh, for that uh, clarity. And once again, thank you both uh, for the great presentation. Um, and feel free to hang around uh, at the B-Sides conference uh, this year.
Um, we do have a breakout room uh, if you would like to uh, uh, answer any further questions or if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to join us sure. in the breakout room. Um, but other than that, once again, thank you and, uh, and welcome to B-Sides and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks. Thank you very much. Great to be here. Yeah. <laughs>